thank you all for tuning in tonight. Um, and I really want to say I'm very happy to do this webinar. And I want to say thank you to Dee for inviting me to do it. Um, there are a lot of different published versions of the manifesto, and I've used two in preparation uh, this, um, for this webinar. Uh, and the, the two that I used, one is a, a, a collection that um, is just out uh, by a, uh, a philosopher that is very good um, uh, annotated um, manifesto. And the other is a, a edition that came out in 1998, which is the uh, Eric Hobbs, Hobbsbaum uh, introduction. It was a, a beautifully um, put together book by Verso. So without further ado, we'll get to the authors of the Communist Manifesto, of course. Sir Carson Friedrich Engels. I always uh, prefer to use this young picture of Karl Marx um, because it's so compelling and he, he is so closer in age to the ages of my students um, in this picture. Um, so the manifesto of the Communist Party was the manifesto of a group called the League of Communists, which was a secret revolutionary society that was formed in Paris by German tailors and woodworkers in around 1830. Um, the book was, it was really a pamphlet published in February 1948, 1848, excuse me, by the Workers Educational Association in London. But by 1917, hundreds of editions in over 30 languages had been published, including Chinese and Japanese. It was pretty much all over the globe by 1917. Now, it is 168 years old, and as a result, there are some consequences of the age of the pamphlet. Um, I think we have to read with some care because meanings do shift over the course of that 120, 168 years. Um, and I'll give you some examples. One is um, there's a very um, oft-quoted uh, section um, about the way the bourgeoisie has rescued um, a large proportion of the population from the idiocy of rural life. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, now, the, the phrase, the idiocy of rural life, is something that might ring true for us maybe when we're looking at election returns from the state of Ohio or something like that, um, where you have such a difference um, in rural, <clears throat> excuse me, and urban um, consciousness. But um, Marx and Engels didn't mean idiocy in that sense. They meant idiocy just to mean isolation. People in rural areas were really isolated from the, um, the ideas of the day and social interaction of the day. Another example is the word barbarian. Marx and Engels use the word barbarian in this book. Um, and what barbarian really connotes in, that, in contemporary anthropology of the time uh, was a term for any preliterate society, no judgment. And finally, the word party. Um, he talks about, Marx and Engels talk about the Communist Party, especially in part two. Um, and that's a, a section where um, he's not talking, they're not talking about an organized party, but just a group of people with common political beliefs. So that's one consequence of age. Another is that there are better developed analyses of political economy, economy by um, Marx and Engels offered in later works, especially in Capital. This is just a start because it is an early work. And finally, um, because it's so old, some of it is more meaningful in uh, a particular time and place. And that's why I'm concentrating in this webinar on parts one and two, because I think part three needs um, so much of the historical context that uh, to make it, it meaningful to us now. Um, but that said, there's a lot of enduring value in the Communist Manifesto. First of all, there's a brilliant analysis of the historical development of economic life and the impact of uh, capitalism on other parts of society. Second, there's this vision in this, in this text the cap is not a permanent end of history, but instead it's just a temporary phase in human history, uh, different from what came before it and different from what's going to come after it. And finally, well, not really finally, but another uh, aspect of its enduring value is the programmatic statement that distinguishes the communists from other groups of the time. So as a result, um, the, the Communist Manifesto has been, been called histories, 
most important political document um, by philosopher Phil Gasper, who the book I, I used for this, um, uh, relied on to some extent for this uh, webinar. Eric Hobsbawm, the uh, historian, talks about the new reader of the Communist Manifesto, reading it for the first time. The new reader can hardly fail to be swept away by the passionate conviction, the concentrated brevity, the intellectual and stylistic force of this astonishing pamphlet. So um, I have some, some visuals thrown in here, uh, and the, the, um, all the details of these are in the final slide, um, so you'll know what I've, where I've taken these pictures from. Um, but as I said, I'm going to concentrate on part one and then part two. But after part one, then we'll, have a, we'll pause to take a question or comments or perhaps answers to the uh, discussion questions that were sent out, um, and, and we'll go from there. So I'll start with um, section one, and that's bourgeois and proletarians. And this section begins with one of the most provocative and succinct statements, and that is, what we know as history is the history of struggles between classes. And this is really more profound than um, than one thinks on the surface. Now, first of all, what are what are classes? For for Marx, classes are groups of people with a common relationship to the means of production, a common situation, a, a, a standpoint, the uh, structure of any one mode of production. So um, every mode of production, uh, from agriculture to pastoralism to industry, gives rise to groups of people with different relationships to the means of production. And these classes have always in history been hierarchical. That is, there's always one ruling class dominant over the whole society. For instance, in the, in the days of feudalism, the ruling class was the landed aristocracy, which controlled countryside and appropriated the fruits of the labor of the serfs. The beginnings of the bourgeoisie, um, on the other hand, were to be found um, in the artisans under, in the feudalist, feudal days, who were gradually developing industrial forms of production. And along with those industrial forms of production, the artisans were developing relations of production that became incompatible with the old system, the old feudal system. So in the first paragraph of section one, Marx and Engels describe how capitalist society or bourgeois society, and I think we can use those interchangeably here, emerged from the ruins of feudalism. And feudalism had been torn asunder by these class antagonisms between the bourgeoisie and the aristocracy. And that class struggle is the motor of history. Uh, class struggle moved <clears throat> humanity from feudalism to bourgeois society or capitalist society, and class struggle will hopefully move us from capitalism to communism. Now, in this, um, in this section, uh, Marx and Engels characterize the bourgeoisie. They're a seemingly unstoppable force, developing instruments of production, that is technology, and avenues of communication extremely rapidly. They cause environmental degradation, and that's something people don't recognize sometimes that Marx and Engels were concerned with. Uh, but they were, and it shows in this text. And they were trying uh, to reproduce capitalism everywhere on Earth, um, expanding it since throughout the globe. Um, <clears throat> so uh, for instance, they said um, that capitalism, uh, one of my favorite quotes is from paragraph 19. By the way, all these um, these notations, that's, that's I.19 means section one, paragraph 19. It's easier to just number the paragraphs and, and make references that way. Um, but paragraph 19 says, capitalism must nestle everywhere, settle everywhere, establish connections everywhere. And I'm reminded of this quote a lot when I think about um, the way capitalists are irritated by areas of the world that claim to be off limits from capital like um, Cuba, for example, or the former Soviet Union. And capital pushes against these places with every weapon in its arsenal. Um, so um, so I, I really find that so um, compelling, compellingly true uh, today. 
Now, Marx and Engels also, um, another accurate prediction they make in this uh, text is predicting the ever-worsening crises that are endemic to capitalism. And, uh, and the response to these crises is just the, con the exploitation and conquest of new markets and further exploitation, more thorough exploitation of old markets. Um, capitalism turns men, women, and children into mere instruments of labor. When Marx and Engels describe uh, the changes the bourgeoisie has made when it defeated the feudal aristocracy, their writing is really passionate. And I have a couple of quotes here. Uh, the bourgeoisie, um, this is about how everything turns into a cash transaction in capitalist society. They say the bourgeoisie has drowned the most heavenly ecstasies of religious fervor, of chivalrous enthusiasm, of Philistine sentimentalism in the icy water of egotistical calculation. Um, it's so, so vividly written. Another um, example is, uh, of this is the bourgeoisie has stripped halo every occupation hitherto honored. It has converted the physician, the lawyer, the priest, the poet, the scientist into its paid wage laborers. And that's a particular uh, phrase that comes to mind when I uh, think about how, uh, how university faculty are, um, are treated these days. Instead of the, 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 the tenure system or a, a revered occupation, instead more and more uh, universities are turning to uh, poorly paid adjunct faculty that are temporarily hired, have no benefits. Um, they're just treated as, as uh, waged labor. Another uh, beautiful piece of writing that has just been very influential on further um, social theorists in the future after um, writing after Marx is on um, uh, paragraph 18, when Marx and Engels are writing about the relentless dis disru dis disruption of relations of production that's caused by the fact that the bourgeois, bourgeois competition and exploitation um, changes those, those relationships all the time. Um, Marx and Engels write, relationships become antiquated before they can ossify. All that is solid melts into air. All that is holy is profaned. That's something that's often quoted after, uh, after this has been published. At the same time, Marx and Engels uh, acknowledge that capitalist society represented a substantial, radical advance over feudal society. And that's why I asked one of those discussion questions that I have on that list. The bourgeoisie brought things that seemed to be very progressive and were very progressive if you compare them to feudal times. The bourgeoisie brought cosmopolitan cultural practices and they developed intellectual production. It brought the infrastructure that will, in the end, enable the proletariat to defeat the bourgeoisie. So in their analysis of the way class struggle um, has transformed society, Marx and Engels lay out the process by which class struggle leads to profound social and economic changes. And that's uh, the, the idea that bourgeois society contains within it the seeds of its own destruction. Uh, for one thing, capitalism and the bourgeoisie have created and consolidated another class, and that is the proletariat, the working people who sell their labor to the owners of the means of production. Um, and they, they, they say here, a class of laborers who live only so long as they can find work, who must sell them themselves to meal, and who are a commodity exposed to all the vicissitudes of competition, to all the fluctuations of the market. So capitalism raises the stakes on the class struggle such that the whole society is increasingly polarized into two great opposing classes, the bourgeoisie, that is the ruling class, and the proletariat, which will ultimately represent the majority of society and now struggles against the bourgeoisie. Marx and Engels also in this section talk about the conditions under which workers are, uh, live in bourgeois society. Um, they have very oppressive, alienated conditions, subsistence wages, monotonous work as an appendage of the machine, in their words. So uh, the class develops in its struggle with the ruling class. Early on, the working class may attack 
um, the machines themselves, as the Luddites did in England. Ned Ludd was a um, an agricultural worker who who uh, rallied his fellow uh, workers to attack the machines that they saw as um, taking uh, their jobs away. Um, but gradually, the proletariat becomes better organized, in large part thanks to the bourgeoisie, which is bringing them together, um, and they form trade unions. Um, towards the end of this section um, is a reference. Uh, I just have a couple more points from, um, from section one. And then I'm looking forward to hearing from you all. Um, there's a couple of things. There's, first of all, the role of ideas is hinted at um, <clears throat> toward the end of this section. Uh, there's a reference to the way ideas that benefit the ruling class are the ruling ideas of any age. <clears throat> and this is in paragraph 47. And, he, and they say, for the worker, law, morality, religion are to him so many bourgeois prejudices behind which lurk in ambush just as many bourgeois interests. So, um, so they not only are, are law, morality, and religion thrown into, into doubt because they reflect bourgeois prejudices, the practice of that law, morality, and religion actually serves the, the economic interests of the bourgeoisie in a, in a hidden kind of way. Those, those, those interests lurk in ambush but are served by ideas in society. And they'll get more into this idea um, in part two, but also in, uh, in future books like the German ideology is, I think, where this idea of the ruling class and the ruling ideas is best um, uh, explicated. Um, and then finally, the very end of this um, section is, is very interesting, too. Um, there's a, a very certain prediction. Uh, quote, what the bourgeoisie therefore produces, above all, are its own grave diggers. Its fall and the victory of the proletariat equally inevitable. And people turn to that, that phrase are, to ask the question, are Marx and Engels saying it's inevitable that the proletariat will be victorious? Other sections of this book and other sec many parts of um, the other writings uh, capital especially, um, indicate that they don't see this as an inevitability, but that this may be more a rhetorical flourish at the end of the section. Um, so I did have some questions. I, don't, I think these came out um, to everybody, um, and I'll just mention them quickly, and then we can open it up um, to the, the uh, participants. Uh, why do Marx and Engels say the bourgeoisie has played a revolutionary part? Uh, what are some examples of class struggle today? Um, in what ways is the family a mere money relation in society? That's one of the, one of the, the relation, human relationships that the bourgeoisie has reduced to a cash um, commodity um, or cash relationship. And finally, what are some other ways that capitalism or bourgeois society affects people's lives. So um, those questions that I have for you, I have another little visual here. Um, and I, if um, Dee, if you could open it up, I um, will hear what people have to say. OK, if you'd like to respond to the questions or make or raise another question or uh, make a comment, please use your raised hand icon. Just click your raised hand icon. And I will uh, find your name, and I will open your mic. OK, I see. Um, just click your raised hand icon if you want to make a comment. You have to leave your, OK. Larry, your mic is open. Larry. Uh, thank you. I just want to make one comment about uh, the the role that the bourgeoisie have played uh, as far as the revolutionary role. Mm -hmm. um, my understanding of the text is that <clears throat> they played the revolutionary role because whenever they gained the upper hand, um, they were the ones that um, basically challenged the, the the ruling classes during the during the age of feudalism. So uh, I think the American Revolution is a good example of this, where uh, we, where the bourgeoisie played a major role in, in breaking down uh, monarchy. And also, the bourgeoisie 
and the system of capitalism um, has revolutionized the means of production. A constant revolution in terms of um, <clears throat> innovation, uh, and that will in turn make socialism possible, because uh, socialism is in effect uh, the house that was built by, by capitalism. So um, that's all I have to say. That's very real, but I think um, you're right. The, the bourgeoisie was revolutionary in the sense that it, it struggled against the aristocracy and won, um, and does constantly um, revolutionize the the means of production. I mean, all of the, the scientific um, breakthroughs that were possible or that that happened um, in the service of the bourgeois uh, interests is is another example of that. So I I agree. Thanks. Okay, uh, Janine, your your mic is open. Janine, hi, hi. <laughs> I actually didn't know my mic was open, so now that you've got me, uh huh. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I wasn't going to ask any questions. I wanted to find out how long this webinar was going to go, uh -huh. and if you were going to be presenting any more content or. If uh, it was the rest of it was just going to be discussions. Well, I have another section of content on section two of the Communist Manifesto, which we'll get to after this section of, of questions and comments. So okay, uh, a little well, bit more. And I think we're not supposed to. We we don't go over more. Than, it's about an hour or so total. And we started. Okay. Well, I'm going to stay on then and keep listening. Okay. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, if you'd like to make a comment, raise a question, or respond to a question, please use your raised hand icon. Kobe, your mic is open. Um, does the Communist Manifesto imply a vanguardism? Uh, what do you mean by vanguardism? Um, basically just the general concept. Uh, okay. Well, I, I, I don't, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by vanguardism. I would say, I mean, they do, in, especially in the second section that we're going to talk about, they talk about how communists as a, as a party, but they're really just talking about as communists, are um, representing the entire working class. So they're, um, I, is, that what you mean that they're they're um, they're leading um, the proletariat is that what you're getting at with vanguardism I'm not sure what your question is I guess uh, I mean they do see communists as um, representing the entire working class uh, yes that was exactly what I was asking thank you mm -hmm. okay thanks That's my interpretation of part two, anyway. So we can talk about that when we talk about part two. Maria, other? Maria, you have to okay. unmute your mic. Just click on your mic. OK, there you go. Your mic is open. Maria, your mic is open. Please speak. OK, we don't hear you. OK. Lee, your mic is open. Lee Gordon, your mic is open. Lee Gordon. Lee? Speak up, please. OK. You have your raised hand icon showing. Your mic is open. Lee Gordon, Ash. OK, we don't hear you. Okay, let's see. Emil, you have to unmute your mic. Okay, uh, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay, hello, Anita, and thank you so much for listening to the Ed Department. Oh, Emil, thank you. Yes, thanks for tuning in. Excellent series. Uh, I'm always thinking about this issue of how we could find examples of class struggle in our society today, and I think it's easier to make 
a list of things that are not class struggle, mm -hmm. which uh, would be essentially a short list of zero items. Mm -hmm. uh, you think about just about every struggle we're involved in or should be involved in if we had the time and the people, and there's a class dimension to it. Uh, for instance, the environment struggle, the anti-racism struggle, and, and all the rest. In Chicago, I know uh, my former hometown is having this huge struggle on the subject of police abuses, uh, right. which I'm very familiar with, unfortunately, kind of firsthand in some occasions. Mm -hmm. And all of that is class uh, class structure. Uh, but the trouble is the working class and allies don't always immediately realize it. So our job, I think, as Marxists is, among other things, to work to kind of pull out the thread of class struggle that runs through just about every conflictive aspect of our society. Mm -hmm. And I think that Marx and Engels and the manifesto and all that followed are just an extremely useful tool mm -hmm. in doing that. And certainly when I was, I has actually had had to read this in 1962 in high school. Mm -hmm. And it completely ruined my mind and uh, <laughs> made me unemployable. I've never regretted it. Thank you again. Okay, thank you, Emil. I, I really, I, what you say really resonates uh, with me too. I also um, picked up this book when I was in junior high school and I didn't understand a word of it, but I could see that it made adults around me uncomfortable and that was just what I was going for. So um, I stuck with it. I, I understand it a little bit better than I did then. But, um, but yes, I agree that it's um, so often you hear people talk about the government as the enemy. And really, uh, this um, uh, Marx and Engels are so clear about what the role of the state is and what the role of the ruling class is. Um, and, and bringing people back to the idea that it is a class struggle is really is really a, a, a step in the right direction um, in raising people's consciousness. So I agree. Thanks, Emil. Ashley, you have to unmute your mic. Your mic is open, Ashley, but you have to click your mic. There you go. Hello? Yes. Hi, Ashley. Hi. Yep. Hi. Thank you very much for hosting this first call. Thank you. And I have just a very simple yet important question. The word starts the B that sounds French. Yes. How do you pronounce that? A uh, bourgeois? Is that yeah. what you mean? Yeah. You know, this is an interesting question because um, it's bourgeois. It's like um, the German burger. It's, it's urban, an urban dweller. Um, originally, uh, as I understand it, and these were this was the the group of, of um, people um, that grew out of the artisan class in feudalism in the urban areas and gradually developed the instruments of production to an industrial level and uh, very gradually, and then became the ruling class in capitalist society. But I always think of the word bourgeois as um, an adjective. Um, and bourgeoisie as the noun that depicts the entire class. So um, that's why the um, yeah the part one starts out with the um, entitled bourgeois and proletarians. That doesn't sound right to me, but you know, um, yeah, it's bourgeois. It's it's less class. The owners of the means of production. Okay, I tried putting it in my phone, but it went auto-corrected, so I had it way off, so. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of vowels in there. Because yeah. Of word, so. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, we'll take one more. Okay. All right. Uh, Catherine, your mic is open. Catherine Pottinger, your mic is open. Okay, we don't hear you. Okay. Okay. Uh, Catalina, you have to click on your mic. Okay, Catalina, your mic is open. Hello, uh, I'm sorry, Catalina is my daughter, and we're sharing this uh, uh, opportunity. Uh, I'm her father, Eduardo. Uh, uh, my question is this. Uh, I believe um, Marx, in, in one moment, 
uh, said that uh, capitalism tends to reinvent, which is a very speculative uh, economic model. I was, uh, I, I don't know if uh, you share with me this idea that technology today is uh, doing that, is reinventing capitalism. Would you, mm -hmm. would you, would you uh, comment on this, please? Interesting. Well, um, you'll have to turn down the sound, or um, I can hear myself talking through. But um, capitalism tends to reinvent itself as an economic model. I think um, that um, idea um, reminds me of that quote around the time when he was talking about, they were talking about how capitalism expands to other markets. It constantly wants to, to um, create a bourgeois society in every market that it finds. Um, so that is one thing. But I, I think the other thing that you're referring to is that idea of the bourgeoisie because of competition um, from uh, among capitalists themselves, they are constantly reinventing and dis developing the means of production and the avenues of communication. So um, technology is constantly reinventing, um, it's constantly being reinvented. I'm right to reinventing capitalism. Capitalists want to reinvent capitalism and, and reinstall or or install capitalism in every um, in every sector of society in every um, in every um, niche of uh, of the world. Um, I, for instance, um, I know we've we, I've looked at work about teachers and and education and why is education a field right now that. Um, unions are getting such a hard uh, time. I think um, when, and the analysis is that, well, um, education is one of those fields that has resisted capitalism, but now capitalists are rushing in trying to monetize education, the field of education. So I think um, there are constantly, um, the, the, the bourgeoisie is constantly trying to find new markets, new ways of making money, new, new avenues of monetizing, um, and technology is one way of doing that. So um, I agree, I think, with you, what, with what you're saying. I think those ideas are very resonant with, with what Marx and Engels, Engels are saying here. Thanks. So you might want to continue. One person did uh, write a note saying, will you do more classes on, uh, on uh, uh, like this? So you're already, so that oh, <laughs> you might want to move on. Okay. Okay. Well, that's fine. We can we can move on to the second uh, section then, um, and then we'll have a little more time um, for uh, comments uh, after that. So let's see. Um, by the way, no, uh, this this image that's before you right now, um, it's the uh, stockyard gate in. Um, Chicago, which I just took a picture of a couple of weeks ago. So um, section two is entitled Proletarians and Communists. And um, remember here at the beginning when he's talking about the party, he's talking about party in the sense of a group of people with common political aims, not necessarily an organized body, a party like uh, the Communist Party we have. So Mark an angle here about communists in that sense. They, they are internationalists and they represent, as um, we referred to earlier, the entire working class. Um, and they have three immediate aims. Uh, and those are listed here. Formation of the proletariat into a class, overthrow of the bourgeois supremacy, and conquest of political power by the proletariat. Now, conquest of political power by the proletariat, we'll get to that a little later, too, um, it means to, quote, raise the proletariat to the end of the ruling class uh, to win the battle of democracy, unquote, and that's later in paragraph 68. Um, but let's turn uh, now to that formation of the proletariat into a class. Isn't the proletariat already a class? Um, just by virtue of its position in the economy as sellers of labor power, uh, to the owners of the means of production, they are a class. They have a common interest, a common economic interest. And what Marx and Engels would say about that is that it is a class in itself, but not necessarily for itself yet. 
anyway. Um, they have the common material conditions, um, but they're not yet conscious of their um, their unity, um, the commonness of their um, of their conditions. So the proletariat, in order to become a class for itself, the proletariat needs to develop an awareness um, of itself, um, elsewhere called a communist consciousness, as forming a social class open to opposed to the bourgeoisie. And then it will be a class for itself. It has a subjective component and an objective component. The objective component is a common material conditions. The subjective component is a consciousness that they are a class and that they are opposed to the bourgeoisie. So um, the aims of um, the, all these aims, the, the three aims that are uh, delineated at the beginning of the section, um, all require one thing, and that is abolition of private property. And they describe here um, what they mean by private property. They're not, all, they're not talking about all property. Not all property is bourgeois property. They're not talking about the pre-capitalist kind of um, property. They're talking about capital. And capital is the kind of property which exploits wage labor. Capital is formed by accumulated labor. It's a collective product and represents a social power. And people, he says nine people out of 10, almost like the 99%, don't own this kind of property. So the kind of property that um, Marx and Engels advocate abolishing is not the kind of property that most people own. Um, so so Mark, Marx and Engels uh, talk after abolition of private property and in conjunction with that, they talk in greater detail about, as I've said before, the role of ideas in society. <clears throat> Specifically, bourgeoisie, um, the bourgeois society, capitalist society, is characterized by a culture. And by culture, I sort of mean in an anthropological sense, the ideas, symbols, and meanings. And this culture serves the ruling class. And the ideas of the ruling class, they seem to be natural ideas or permanent ideas. Um, but we know they aren't, because if you look back in history, the ruling ideas of the feudal age seemed um, natural at the time, but they cycled out along with the material conditions that caused, called them into existence in the first place. So um, a couple of quotes from that, ideas and the ruling class. Um, he's, they're talking, Marx and Engels here are talking as if they're talking to a bourgeois person, I guess. You, uh, your very ideas are the outgrowth of the conditions of your bourgeois production and your bourgeois property, just as your jurisprudence is but the will of your class made into a law for all. So that's another expression of the fact that law and other as of culture, other um, superstructural phenomena in society are in the service of the ruling class. Um, this, this idea of, of overturning some of these cultural ideas is very um, is an anathema to the bourgeoisie because disappearance of bourgeois culture seems to the bourgeoisie to be the disappearance of all culture. So um, it, they uh, are not, um, you know, uh, going along with that. An example <clears throat> of a ruling class idea. Um, is uh, the idea of freedom, and they talk about this quite a bit in this section. Freedom seems to be and is presented as an enduring, natural, permanent value by the capitalist uh, s system. But freedom in bourgeois society just means freedom for one person to control, to accumulate wealth by controlling the labor of others. And this I put in parentheses here, appearance and reality. This is a, um, in, uh, when sociologists approach Marx, they often talk about this contrast between appearance and reality, what, what things look like, um, and those things look like that because they are endowed with these ideas from the ruling class, but the reality is the material conditions that are affected by these, um, these conditions and these ideas. Um, Okay, another example, um, an example that I always uh, use in, in my class is the idea of traditional family. And he doesn't go into this um, in, um, the, this is something I, I'm 
take idea, a contemporary idea, a ruling class idea. The nuclear family contempor in contemporary society um, is presented by bourgeois culture as this enduring, permanent, natural form, um, and they call it traditional, the nuclear family. But really, uh, the nuclear family is a modern capitalist um, invention. It created the nuclear family for its own purposes, that is, for example, moving labor from one, one uh, part of the world to another part of the world, or one part of a, a state to another part of the state to suit capitalist needs. Um, it's, it's very, you can't, um, a, a traditional family in human form, the real traditional family, um, the way humans grouped themselves for hundreds of thousands of years is an extended family that includes multiple uh, three or more generations and you know 25 or, or 30 people. Um, this is not a family that can be moved around uh, to suit labor. So um, so instead we have this fiction of a traditional family, nuclear family. Um, I'm very interested in education, and this um, this comes up in the, the context of the ideas and culture and ruling class ideas. Uh, Marx and Engels here talk about education as the bourgeois ruling class's way of inculcating ruling class ideas and making them seem natural and permanent. Um, they ask, what is bourgeois education for the enormous majority? Bourgeois education is a mere training to act as a machine. Um, Communists aim to rescue education from the influence of the ruling class. Um, I, I, I like to think of that as a, a, a reason to be an educator, um, is to try to rescue education from that influence. Um, the idea of acting, uh, training to act as a machine reminds me of some contemporary education where working class kids are forced to spend forced to spend their formative years um, in substandard schools, really being tra trained to obey, uh, to accept bourgeois culture as natural and permanent, and to fit into the economic system as, as low-paid workers. So how uh, can this be transformed? Um, Marx and Engels say uh, here first, um, to raise uh, the proletariat to the position of the ruling class, is the first step to win the battle of democracy, and then to wrest by degrees all capital from the bourgeoisie, to centralize all instruments of production of the state. So the, the, um, they follow this with a 10-point set of demands, and this is in paragraph 72 of uh, section uh, 2, towards the end of section 2. Um, these are aimed at revolutionizing uh, the mode of production. And uh, interesting, there are a lot of interesting features about this, um, th this section. Uh, it includes environmental issues, and I always point this out because people think that um, they don't uh, pay that much attention to environmental issues. Um, and it includes improvement of the soil and abolition of the distinction between town and country, which is, is uh, the two um, points where they're concerned about um, the uh, environment. But of course, there's some very familiar, uh, familiar uh, ideas in this set of demands. And this is the programmatic set of demands that um, distinguishes this as a, a, a communist program. So um, uh, he imagined, um, they imagine, Marx and Engels imagine a future without a class hierarchy towards the end of this um, section. It um, talks about, they talk about the steps that the proletariat takes. First, the proletariat organizes itself as a class, a class with a class consciousness, and a, it's a class for itself. It struggles against the bourgeoisie, and it ultimately makes itself the ruling class. It sweeps solutions for the existence of class struggle in the first place, therefore abolishing its own supremacy as a class, and finally creates a society in which the free development of each is the condition for the free development of all. And I like the way Marx and Engels go back after, after um, uh, criticizing the, the bourgeois concept of freedom, they bring up the freedom uh, for the free development of all in the, in the conclusion here. So, um, so those um, are some of the points that I, I'm taking away from um, section two. 
Um, I have some discussion questions here as well. The idea of freedom, which we've talked about a little bit, um, educational institutions, um, what has capitalist society done to the status of women? And he talks about the status of women in this section. Um, Marx and Engels respond to common crimes that have been launched at, common, at communism in general in these pages. Are, I wonder if um, participants think that these criticisms are still voiced today. They sit, they sound as somewhat familiar to me. And, um, and of course, I'm pointing out the environment again there. So, um, so let's see, it's 10 of. I think if, if um, folks have um, some more um, comments, I'd really be interested in hearing what other folks have to say. Okay, use your raised hand icon if you want to, want to speak. And I see that uh, Michael, your mic is open, Michael Van Brocklin. Ah, Michael. Thank you. Hello, Anita. Hey, Michael. How are you doing? Fine, thank you. Um, I actually, my mic was still open from earlier, but um, it, the question would still kind of pertain uh, in part two. When it talks about uh, eternal truths and, and religious, moral, philosophical uh, uh, ideas, um, Mm. And I'm curious, so much has changed since this was written, obviously, um, and I'm thinking in particular uh, about the idea that at, at the time, uh, religion in particular may have been used as a, as a state tool uh, to, to pacify uh, the work. But that's changed a lot uh, in this century, uh, and I'm thinking of liberation theology. Um, mm -hmm. When Marx talks about, and Engels talk about uh, abolishing eternal truths uh, and all morality instead of constituting them on a new basis, I wonder if there's room within that to look at like the Cuban model today and how the state uh, uh, the church in, under you know socialism in Cuba is actually working hand in hand with the revolution to uh, address the needs of the people. What, mm -hmm. what do you think about that? I'm curious. Well, that's that's a really good question, Michael. Um, I think <clears throat> I think again we're not we're, we 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 need to concentrate on the the idea of religion being not necessarily a tool of the state against people, but a tool of the ruling class against people, uh, against the, the free development of people. And I think, I think Marx and Engels were, um, were uh, concerned about, um, about that um, relationship. I'm trying to think about um, there. I, I, I'm not really concentrating on section um, three uh, um, of the manifesto here, and I'm not sure it was there, whether it was there or somewhere else where I read um, they had something to say about religious-based uh, socialism, um, and, and it was, it was, it was um, skeptical. They're skeptical of, of those kind of relationships. Um, uh, but that's a, that's a really good question. I'm actually I'm thinking uh, I, I am having to teach a class next semester on religion and society, and it, it, it is a kind of a question that I am always um, dealing with about uh, what what is the role of those ideas. So if if the the ideas of any age are ruling class ideas, um, and and the ideas that are dominant in a society like ours are are, are um, some values that come from Judeo-Christian heritage. We have to be we have to be very careful that those ideas are not are not serving um, the interests of, of the ruling class. And I think if we are, are critical and skeptical every step of the way, um, we can. Uh, I'm I'm not sure how I would put it in terms of that uh, quote about uh, eternal truths, um, but I think. Um, I think I agree that um, in Cuba, for example, that that um, detente between um, religious ideas and leadership and um, and the revolution is is something that it is is very valuable and 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 
helps people develop in a free way um, there in that case anyway. So, but a really good question, hard. So. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Any other hands? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, Great. Charles. Charles, you have to unmute your, your mic yourself. It's unmuted on our end. Just click your mic. Your mic is open. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Uh, Miss um, Professor, uh, what about the uh, issue pertaining to um, the immigration issues that uh, that is um, going about over in Europe in regard to uh, Muslim immigration, and also the correlation with um, Hispanic immigration from Latin America, particularly the countries of uh, Central America and Mexico, in regard to um, to what uh, um, Marx and Engels was talking about in the uh, in, in the manifesto. I'll take my answer off there. Mm, okay. Wow, that's a good question. I. I I have to think um, through all of that. The immigration issue in Europe of um, uh, area from areas of the Syria and Iraq, um, um, refugees and other immigrants moving into Europe on the one hand, and also people from Latin America coming into the United States and, and Canada um, on the other hand. I think um, I think uh, the way I would relate those issues back to the manifesto is um, looking at um, what Marx and Engels say in section one about the global expansion of capital. Um, and the, the global expansion of capital doesn't create, they say they recreate bourgeois society in, in every society, but um, really societies are um, almost like a ruling of uh, uh, um, low wage, low wage countries. They're, Almost well, I want to say it's it's almost like uh, later Emmanuel Wallerstein and other folks like that um, talk about the core and the periphery. That um, there's a hierarchy of nations as well as a hierarchy of classes. Um, and in the global economy, it turns it it it, it the class struggle sometimes um, not itself as a struggle among nations or struggles among cultures. Um, I think uh, I, I think it is important um, with the, the case of uh, Muslim immigrants in Europe to remember that um, for Marx and Engels, um, religion is a superstructural phenomenon. Um, what, one of my favorite parts of um, uh, Karl Marx's work is uh, uh, well, a book called *The Eight Tear of Napoleon Bonaparte*. Um, and in this in this book, 18th Brumaire, he's talking about the period of time from around 1830 to 1848, and it's a time that every high school textbook of or college textbook of uh, European history will tell you this is a conflict between Protestants and Catholics. But Marx and Engels don't characterize it as a religious conflict like we do in bourgeois history. Um, instead, they, they show that it's a conflict between a landed aristocracy and the industrial um, new, new rising up um, bourgeoisie. Um, and, then, and then maybe in a footnote, halfway through the book, um, he says, uh, oh, by the way, uh, the uh, Orleanists are Catholic and the, um, the Bourbons were Protestants. So, um, so yes, they did have these, um, these religious labels. But those religious labels would have had to have been invented if they weren't already there, um, just to express the differences in material conditions between those two groups. So I would look behind those uh, those characterizations of of, um, of group conflict as a, a religious conflict and look behind that and see what are the real material conditions under which people are living um, and and how how that actually. Um, makes a better explanation of what um, what is going on in their lives. So, but thanks for that question. That's really good that you can apply this these to a lot of contemporary problems. Thanks. Okay, is, is Bill, your mic is open. Yes. Um, thanks for the class. Uh, what Thank I you. want, what I want, you're welcome. What I want to ask was. Um, in transition, uh, in recorded history, as Marx and Engels refer to, 
um, in the transition from one um, exploited society to another. Right. Um, there has always been a substitution of new a dominant or a new exploitive class and, and a class that's being exploited or is subdominant. Um, mm -hmm. In all of those cases, there was the, the, the revolutionary class mm -hmm. uh, was never a majority and the, subs the, the new substituting class was never a majority. Um, but always in all cases, I think a, a majority of the masses was necessary for for the for the for the um, mm -hmm. that um, overthrow and that change to occur in the economic system that was that replaced it. Yes, uh, there's some reference to um, this. Um, I don't think it's in the manifesto, but is there some reference to this in Marx's works um, as far as whether the the class that will overthrow the the the, the bourgeoisie necessarily majority? And I'm talking about numbers. That's what I'm talking about. And since class society has existed, there has never been a society where that has been overthrown by a majority of the new ruling uh, of by a majority which became the new, ruling, the new ruling class, but it was always a majority, of course, of the masses. That's right. right. Good point, and I think um, that is a very subtle point that is made in the in these pages. I didn't concentrate on that too much, and I I'm not even sure where. I think it's in in this too. Um, you're right that the newly exploited class, like for instance, the bourgeoisie, was certainly not a majority. Um, when it became um, a revolutionary class and struggle against the aristocracy. However, it did try to bring along with it uh, the petty bourgeoisie um, and workers and, and others. Um, he, he, although um, capitalism brings together these two great classes of the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, Marx and Engels are really aware of the other kinds of classes that are available that are extant in society, like the petty bourgeoisie, which is the group that owns small um, small uh, means of production. Um, the peasants who have small holdings um, are different bourgeoisie or the proletariat. Um, but the, um, the majority class or the, the revolutionary class works to bring those people in on its, for its cause. And even the the working class, the contemporary of, of this um, document, the contemporary working class um, was um, was joined by even a segment of the ruling class joined the interests of the, the working class and struggled against the bourgeoisie. So, um, so you're right, but I think also um, that's how it's been. The, the the not the revolutionary class has never been a majority in the past, but I think they are predicting here evolutionary the next revolutionary class the proletariat will represent a majority of society because um, capitalist society works to concentrate more and more concentrate um, resources in the hands of a few um, concentrate wealth and as a result of that the majority of people are disfranchised and more and more people join the ranks of wage labor and I think they see that will be a majority when it's a revolution, revolutionary class. But that's a good point. Thank you. Okay, you have two more hands. Do you want to take these? Sure. Okay. Benito, your mic is open. Benito, your can mic. Can you hear me, Denise? Yeah. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I think I heard you say earlier, and correct me if I'm wrong, that, mm -hmm. um, let me get this, that uh, raising the, the working class to the level of the new ruling class mm -hmm. is the first step in the struggle to advance democracy. So can you clarify what you said? 
Let's see. Um, yeah. Okay, that um, it, it, that's around the um, maybe paragraph seventy three of of that section. Um, and uh, they're talking about how um, the the uh, it's the very end of um, it's the second to last paragraph of um, section uh, two. And they say if the proletariat during its contest um, uh, with the bourgeoisie is compelled to organize itself as a class by means of revolution, it makes itself the ruling class and sweeps away by force the old conditions of production, then it will, along with those conditions, have swept away the conditions for the existence of class antagonisms. So it's almost simultaneous. But I think that they wouldn't say that's the first step. Um, I mean, they, they talk earlier about the other steps of um, the proletariat just needs, first of all, to organize itself as a class in and of itself, in and for itself, and struggle against the bourgeoisie um, to make itself the ruling class. So um, so it's, uh, there are, are not the first step to, to I mean, that uh, that is the victory of the of the uh, bourgeoisie, I mean, of the proletariat to make itself the ruling class and thus sweep away all need for class antagonisms and make itself not the ruling class as a, as a result. Does that make sense? Okay. Classless society, right. You have one more. Antonio, your mic is open. Antonio Leon, your mic is open. All right, he took away his hand. All right, okay. so that that's it. Okay, well, thank you so much for the opportunity to do this. I really appreciate it. Um, oh, oh um, but hold on. Let me just advance my slides um, one more. This is the bibliography. And just so these slides are part of the recorded program. And then this is the, the uh, page with the images um, that are um, in, in the context of the PowerPoint slides. Okay, so we'd like to thank everybody for participating. Anita will send uh, me her slides and I'll be able to send her slides out to all of you. And uh, we do look forward to Anita doing uh, classes on other books, uh, okay. classics uh, in the future, since this okay. one was so good. Oh, thanks. <laughs> thank you, Jane. Right. Thank you, Anita, and thank you, everybody. Okay. Have a good night. Bye-bye. You too. Good night.